Cool. So I have a lot to get through, so I'm just going to jump straight into this. My idea for this, uh, and just like a very brief kind of like characterization of the type of people we're talking about, I'm talking about traditionally trans people, no disrespect there, of course. That is to say people who are transitioning gender or have the intention to transition. This doesn't include like non-binary people, etc. just because that's complicated. People don't understand that for the purpose of this debate. I'm going to keep that out. So with that in mind, like what do I see this as? I see this law or, or this becoming law for a couple for a different reason as to like the current ways that we introduce laws. That is to say that it's not about imposing punishments for people who intentionally break this. It's more about like engineering the types of mechanisms that allow for social change to happen so that we don't need these laws in the future. What that looks like is having a law that has you know, huge overreaching benefits to the trans community and the people that it affects with very little consequence to people who break the law for a number of reasons. Like one, because the punishments themselves for a law like this are likely to be not, you know, huge for the majority of people anyway, given the type of law that it will be. Um, and two, because people are highly unlikely to seek any legal action for people who go and break this law for a number of reasons. I'll get to that in my substantive. Um, and then thirdly, like thirdly, the precedent that this sets for governments is absolutely huge. That is to say, like people will engage more with what a government's saying when it's a law as opposed to a government coming out and saying, you know, we support this thing, therefore you should too. People are more likely to engage in that in a meaningful way. You know, that leads to a whole lot of things that the government can do to, um, you know, set some great things up. Um, so I suppose in summary of that, like, it's, an, it, it, it's a law that's particularly easy to follow with little consequence for the majority of people. Like, that's why we should support it. I have, you know, a couple of different points of substantive. I'm not going to go through them in a minute. So, like, I'll pass over, get the introduction, and then we'll go, keep the debate going. Okay. So a lot of things that I want to jump into this, mainly being that when we're talking about the government mandating people to call trans individuals the pronoun of their preference right so this is this is not an encouragement not saying that the government in, is saying this is a good thing people should start doing this this is saying we are the government we are forcing you to start doing this so we have to reject this resolution because it is an imposition on speech now i believe and i would assume my opponent believes that we should all have a basic fundamental right to f just freedom of speech could i pass it to you and you agree or disagree yep that's fine okay so if if we have a fundamental right to freedom of speech then the government should could encourage speech all day long but we cannot talk about the government mandating speech. So the issue with this resolution is that we are talking about a government mandate saying that you at all times must call this trans individual the pronoun of their preference. Now, this is not a mandate against malice intent of saying the, the resolution does not state saying people are being hateful. This is not a resolution saying that tr we people cannot be hateful towards trans individuals. This is not a resolution saying that we cannot, that the government shouldn't let people or businesses not allow things like that. This is an individual mandate saying that you as a person have to call this person the pronoun of their preference or face consequences, right? So a mandate comes with consequences. I understand that my opponent was not... Um, was saying that we can't have heavy consequences on this, but you, you have to have some sort of consequences with a mandate, meaning that if I don't call this person uh, the correct pronoun of their choice, the government can punish me. And that that is not OK in any way, because if I have done it, if I am just simply speaking and I've got speech and I'm in no way endangering this person, if I'm not harassing this person, if I'm if I'm not actually in impeding on their ability for life, liberty, and property, then why am I facing punishments because I called the wrong gender? This is also almost an unenforceable mandate because with crimes often comes intent. Well, it would be most often impossible to attribute intent to this misgendering. So like, say I was working at a coffee shop and I had a customer that came in and informed me, hey, I want to be called by this pronoun when I come in. If they come in like three weeks later and I forget and I say, sir, here's your coffee and they meet, they identify as a woman, well, can I be punished for a simple accident? Well, it, it's very, while the person might say that I'm just intentionally 
um, misgendering them, it may be an honest mistake. So it's almost an unenforceable law. So this mandate should be null because it's unenforceable, one, but B is an infringement on my freedom of speech and my ability to say things that I want. And if that includes misgendering people, then then that is where speech lies. Now, I want to preface this by saying that I believe that it is respectful and kind to uh, to call people the pronoun of their preference. I believe it allows for better conversations. I think it's just the respectful thing to do. So I don't want to get into like morally because I think we can both agree it's just the respectful thing to do to a person. If they're like, hey, I want to be called this, I'm going to try and be respectful. So we'll go from there. Cool. So all of your material about freedom of speech does not stand, given that the government already regulates that and there are certain things you can't say anyway. This would simply be adding to that in the same way that you cannot say things that are objectively offensive to a person. You cannot actively discriminate against that person. This would fall into that, given that, as you said, you need intent to prove. Therefore, you need to prove that a person has gone out of their way to consistently misgender someone. It's not the case where if you walk into a cafe, misgender someone once, that person is likely to actually like try and take you, take some legal action against you. There's a couple of reasons as to why that's the case. This is going to be my second point of substantive, but like I'm going to do it now. Firstly, the reason why that's true is because, again, like, you know, it, it's not a case of like saying one thing means that you're going to have legal action as is the same with current freedom of speech laws at the point where you say one thing that is offensive to a person. You know, it's unlikely, highly unlikely that they're going to take you to court for that. Right. What this is and like the fact that there aren't huge punishments, the punishments themselves don't matter because people are not likely to actually take legal action because one, you need to prove the intent to offend to like to convict. You need to show that that person has actively done that on a consistent basis. The majority of people, this won't affect given that like the the most amount of harms that are going to come from this, like if you can consistently misgender a person, usually it's because you're friends with them, you know them, you don't understand, whatever, that's fine. Like, it's not like I'm going to walk into a cafe and then sue the cafe because they misgendered me once. Um, the most amount of harm that's going to come from that, you might lose a mate, you might, you know, develop a reputation for being a bit of an ass because you're not being polite and respectful. You know, that's a benefit, that's a harm that I'm happy for people to cop because, like, like I said, we already restrict freedom of speech in some circumstances by not allowing you to say objectively offensive things at the point where this is objectively offensive to trans people given that you are invalidating their entire personhood then that says to me that, that that's not a thing that we should allow people to freely do simply because they want to. Now, like, the principal reason that I wanted to support this is because, like, what it allows the government to do, when they have a law, it means that they have to provide some mechanism for people to understand what that change is, understand why it's changing, and, and like, what this actually means for them. Like, for starters, the most amount of people that this is going to affect is government employees, given that they are representatives of the government, you know, that's a thing. Like, what the government's likely to do in this scenario is create things like education programs, ad campaigns that are focused on changing people's perceptions around, like, what a trans person is and how to have this conversation. That is to say these ads are going to look like, I don't know, a trans person, a non-trans person having a conversation about pronouns and, you know, this person being like, this is what I would prefer. And then having, you know, that ad showing how you should react in that situation and changing perceptions rather than imposing punishments. Like, I'll get more about that into the next segment. You know, I didn't have enough time to finish it, so I'll pass back. One thing that I, I really think we should clear up because I think it'll lead to confusion is um, in America, like we don't have hate speech laws to the level that Australia does. Right. So like we have a First Amendment that lays out specifically freedom of speech. And then like Australia I, is it my understanding. I'll go with British common law and its political expression. Right. Thumbs up if that's correct. OK, so I think we need to kind of lay out like a, a ground rule of like obviously it says the government's not specifying america or australia so we can't really s i'm not sure if we could set the precedent of well your government has has enacted these these speech laws well my government hasn't right so what do you think about that i mean i would be in favor of all governments putting this under freedom of speech laws that you can but like it doesn't matter what the precedent is i'm happy to support governments just in bringing it new in new like regardless of what they've done in the past well, I want to I want to bring in a thing of you, you mentioned light punishments, right? So this mandate coming with light punishments, what punishments would you have in mind if I am misgendering someone? I mean, given that it's usually likely to be someone that you know, someone 
like or it's likely to happen in a place of employment given that like you know you're not going to take your friend to court because they referred you as a male or a female like 20 times like there was punishments i'm happy for them to look like things like i don't know a mandatory education session like you know that goes for like an hour from your employer or like a government representative or, or just something to like educate you on like why this is important and why you need to respect that person in that particular place of work um i'm happy for that to be the punishment like i don't think the punishment is particularly necessary given that like it's the precedent and the actual law itself so i think i think the punishment is the important part is that we're looking at a mandate and if i don't follow this mandate then i'm going to receive some sort of repercussion from the government so right so like i think i could get behind like the government decides to encourage or like release some psas or things like that about the importance of not misgendering or not being abusive i think that's something that like could be getting behind because that's encouraging some speech but if we're talking about mandating speech if you're mandating that i use these pronouns and if i don't then i'm facing repercussions like what we're looking at uh, a precedent that has been set for a similar thing it's not exactly what we're looking at is canada's bill c bill c16 which is um a policy against discrimination against gender identity and expression it is and it has been used some for pronouns now their their punishment for that precedent is fines some some heavy fines upwards of um thousands of dollars so that that's that's a heavy a heavy fine there now i understand that this law practically probably wouldn't be implemented into the guy in the coffee shop that accidentally does it once right but but now he has effectively if this mandate is in there he has committed a crime so while we might not send the kid to jail for stealing a little bit of bubble gum it, it's still committing a crime right so whether or not that's enforced doesn't necessarily mean that we can't allow this to not be a crime um my point is being if we are mandating certain speech it doesn't matter whether or not it's enforced it means that the government has the ability to come in and punish you for misgendering i don't like giving the government the power to come in and punish me for using incorrect speech or any speech right so like if we're this is a this would be a massive precedent in the in the states because we don't have laws on speech like that so now now they've set this precedent here of we can we can tell you that you can't misgender people well what other precedents on speech can we tell me what I can and can't say or what or in this case what you're forcing me to say so when we're talking about not allowing this mandate I you have to reject this resolution because this mandate opens a can of worms of you have now given the government the ability to punish people for misusing pronouns or not calling trans people the pronoun of their choice now personally I think it's a wise thing to do to just use nice nice or use pronouns of preference i think that's respectful and i think i would have no issue with government encouraging speech but when we're talking about a mandate we have to get to the core of this issue which is now you have given the government the ability to come in and punish me personally if i use this pronoun and it's it's just something that cannot be allowed Cool. So in terms of punishments, um, like I said, I'm happy for them to be light. If it looks like a fine, I'm happy to, for it to be like incredibly small. Like the fine for not voting in Australia, I can't remember, it's either like $20 or $50. I'm happy for something like that to come in because like I said, the precedent for this coming is more about, you know, like ending recidivism or people like constantly doing it to the people that they interact with, you know, like changing the perceptions around this. So I'm happy for those for those punishments to be like, inconsequential to those people but the fact that they have some form of punishment is necessary why it's important that this is a mandate and not um like government encouragement before i get into that like just to briefly address like this can of worms thing the precedent that i'm uh, that i would be happy to set is for the government to have control of like people not being able to say things that are objectively offensive that is to say things that like can and will offend like a whole range of people that's not like going around and being like well you know, I don't think you should come into this restaurant because I think your hair color is like awful. Like that's subjectively offensive. At the point where you are objectively offending someone, I'm happy for that to be the precedent the governments have to like restrict speech. I'm pretty like that seems pretty intuitive to me. Cool. So like, what kind of precedent does, does this law set? Like, why why would I rather this be a mandate and rather than like simple encouragement? Like I said in my intro, at the point where a government simply encourages something, 
people will not like respond to that in the same way that they would when it becomes law. What this looks like is the only two voice, the only voice that you'll really hear if government encourages this are the people who oppose it. Given that the people who support it are going to be like, yeah, cool, whatever, I don't care. The people that oppose it are usually likely to be louder, far more vicious. What this looks like is it looks like them dominating the conversation around that particular issue. In this case, in America, it would be like people who, I don't know, don't like trans people um, being very loud and being like, no, we don't support this for all of these reasons. At the point where you allow them to dominate that social discourse, that leads to bad outcomes. It leads to people like just, you know, disliking trans people even more. At the point where it's a law and the government has to set up mechanisms to like ensure that people like understand what's happening, why it's changing and how to respond to that meaningfully. The government then dominates the conversation, which means that of course you'll have, you know, opposition I'm happy for that to occur. But at the point where the national discourse around that particular issue is far more moderate, it means that people are going to have better discourse. It means that that's going to lead to better change, that you don't need laws like this in the future. That looks like people changing their opinions about whether they should or should not do this based on like actual meaningful conversations they wouldn't have if the government encouraged it because people would either turn a blind eye or they would very staunchly oppose it and not have a meaningful conversation about that. That's why I think this is a good precedent to set. It means that like the end, um, the machinations of social change are far better engineered on my side, given that like people will engage with it simply because it's a law, not an encouragement. That's the same with like anything that a government does. Back. Okay, so let's set precedent of of what a mandate has looked like for the discourse, right? So you're talking about encouraging discourse. Well, if, if I would I would uh, somewhat agree that you would have some some heavy opposition if the government started encouraging and not mandating you'd have people that would come out in droves for mandating but what we're getting to the root of it is you're saying a mandate would be more successful because effectively you have suppressed people from speaking out that are heavily in opposition now what we've seen and you you speak to moderate opposition and, and regular discourse against this law right so like people who disagree with this are having discourse well with canada's bill c16 which is probably the heaviest precedent that we have for basing this around um there was a, a student instructor at a canadian university who um in her um, student session, she tried showing a debate between Jordan Peterson, who is anti Bill C 16, and someone else who is pro Bill C 16. And she did not give her opinions on the issue. In fact, she personally disagreed with Jordan Peterson and somewhat supported Bill C 16. She simply was showing the both sides of the issue, right? And, and Jordan Peterson is, is not someone to go out and, and hate trans people. He just simply uh, disagrees with the mandate on speech well what happened there is she was put before a board of her school and and then eventually is in currently dealing with charges from bill c16 for discriminating on gender for even showing two sides of an issue and not even personally taking a stance she's now facing charges with this bill c16 law so clearly these laws are th this law was implemented and now was used as a mechanism to oppress any speech on the issue so when we talk about this government mandate it leaves the air open only for government abuse of this law and that can that can kill discourse on whether or not we should use these pronouns and so i think that ultimately a mandate on using these pronouns if we're talking about the health of discourse will make the discourse incredibly one-sided because whenever there's opposition it will get oppressed because of this mandate and so i think that that cannot be allowed government and government encouragement would be a better thing because while it would it might create some inflammatory discourse at least we're getting both sides and i think you would still get a lot of healthy discourse right and so i think that an encouragement rather than a mandate and also a cultural encouragement right so i think that culture is upstream from politics if we encourage a culture of saying hey this is respectful if on a personal level we make a movement i think that would be much more successful than a government mandate here's why none of that is likely to be true as i said earlier when a government encourages something usually people who agree with that will turn a blind eye because they agree with it anyway there's no point in them engaging in that discourse engage with that in any meaningful way are the people who strongly oppose that why is that bad? At the point where you have them dominating the discourse, um, that creates 
bad discourse, that's likely to change opinion because that's the only voice that people are hearing. If people only hear that trans people are bad and that we shouldn't do this, they're likely to change those opinions. Why it's likely that governments are not going to suppress this at the point where it comes across as a government suppressing freedom of speech, like just by not showing both sides of an opinion, like that government's going to have some form of repercussions. I just don't think that's likely. In the same way that the marriage equality debate in Australia that just happened very recently, the government, despite being in strong favour of marriage equality, did not actually censor the opponents to it. And like, why? Because we supported that discourse. That discourse was happening because it became a law. People had to know about it because they had to or, uh, they had to vote on it. I don't know if they'll vote on this, but like the fact is they had to know because it was becoming a law. At that point, the discourse was far better. It actually swayed people towards like voting yes for it because the only people that had a very loud voice are the people who opposed it very strongly. At the point where you have both opinions, people are likely to go for the side that's not particularly aggressive, the side like they don't hear as much of, in this instance, it's going to be the people that oppose it the most that are going to be loudest. Therefore, that is a good thing that we have both sides. Like I said, unlikely that the government's going to suppress both. Now, why having this like encouragement um, from the government is just not going to work. Like I said, people just will not engage with that at all, or at least the people that we don't need to because they don't care. Or one, they don't care. Two, they don't know any trans people. Three, they don't think it affects them. Four, they don't like trans people. At that point, that encouragement does absolutely nothing than give a platform to people who oppose it. That is a bad outcome for trans people unhappy to support governments, creating a mandate which sets a precedent for them to actually educate people on what this looks like, why it's important, what they need to do in these situations. That is a benefit that I'm happy to cop, even if the discourse is like very oppositional to start with. If it comes with like, you know, benefits in the future, I'm happy to support that. Why is that important? Because like I said earlier in this debate, the government has to have a mechanism for people to understand this. At the point where they control the discourse, whether good or bad, people are going to have those conversations because people need to engage with it, because they need to know, because it's a law that they all need to follow. That just says to me that regardless of whether the government censors them or not, so even if the government censors one side of the debate, that discourse is still going to be both sides because it's a law that everyone needs to know that leads to good benefits because the discourse is there that you don't, that you don't get on your side. That's why I'm happy to support this. Talking, you mentioned that you don't see see an abuse of this, but with the one um, nation that we see a huge precedent set, within months there was abuse, right? So we, we clearly are seeing an issue of a government abusing a speech law, meaning when and that's that happens with speech laws all the time like we're dealing with um in scotland there is a guy who as a joke to his girlfriend taught his pug to sig heil and now he's facing up to a year in prison um because he made an internet video of teaching his pug to sig heil to mess with his girlfriend so wh whether or not you think about that like clearly a year in prison for a joke is is a little outlandish so speech laws tend to get abused and you're talking about this mandate will absolutely suppress healthy conversation about the issue because you are suppressing one side because if they speak out, they have now they could make an argument of now you violated our mandate. We're suppressing your speech. I think that while encouragement, I agree, might not be the best solution, a cultural move of important people like prominent maybe maybe politicians making statements but also celebrities and other important people and also just a community push for equality and not going after um trans people and just saying hey this is the respectful thing to do right like so if this person wants to be called a woman have a good conversation with them and be able to talk with them by calling them a woman or just using their name. If you totally disagree with it, only refer to them by their name. If you're talking about encouragement and a culture shift, that's much healthier and there's no need for government mandate. There's no need for repercussions and there's no abuse, right? So there's no government abuse there. The biggest issue with and why we have to reject the resolution that the government should mandate people is because there will be consequences if you if you don't use these pronouns and because if you are punished 
then then you are suppressing speech and that's an issue but also the abuse that could be used here as has been demonstrated in canada we can't reject that we have to look at that for what it is as an overall issue if if we don't look at that if we just ignore the fact that it is already being abused and is already suppressing just simple dialogue about the law then we obviously see an issue if, if we can't even talk about the law, which is what was going on in Canada, was they weren't even taking a side. They were just saying, let's talk about this law. If they're already facing charges because they talked about the law, then we definitely see an issue with this mandate. So all of the material you just gave actually supports my case. Why? Firstly, you picked the most extreme example of like someone's freedom of speech being imposed, like infringed upon. That is to say, like cheating a group of people's uh, like... Um, I'm not even going to try and say it because, like, I, I don't want to mess it up. But, like, that's actually really offensive to do that. Like, given the amount of people, like, that are, like, disproportionately affected by that, like, that's a good enough reason to support restricting that particular instance. So, like, you know, um, that supports the precedent that I stand by, like, not objectively offending people. Like, I, I'm happy to support that. The second thing, like, apparently suppressing speech kills discourse when the government does it. That's just not true. At the point when a government, like, actively suppresses someone's speech that actually creates more discourse because people aren't just going to be like oh well the government stopped this person from speaking like never mind like don't worry about it they're obviously going to uproar about it that creates more discourse like that discourse is going to be positive in the long run because it's happening under your side it doesn't happen for all of the reasons i gave you in multiple segments of this speech given that like any form of encouragement whether from the government whether it's virtue signaling from celebrities it's only going to affect the people who won already care about it that doesn't impact them at all because they do it anyway or the people who strongly oppose that when we allow them to control that discourse it's really really bad at the end of this well actually like again on the celebrities right celebrity movements just like don't actually enact much change like, sure, people are like, yeah, these people that I think are great are supporting this thing that I also think is great. That doesn't actually lead to change. It just leads to people like virtue signaling being like um, the Me Too movement right at the start of that. It was just a whole bunch of people being like, cool, like I was, I've had this experience too. Like, what's this going to change? Not a lot. It's just a group of people being like, yeah, we support this thing. Like, great. Like that did absolutely nothing. That's what's likely to happen when you have a movement that's pushed by like, um, groups and organizations and celebrities on your side you don't get any of that on my side when, when it becomes a law and you have some form of discourse at all from both sides you are likely to get some form of social change that is a good thing it's also probably worth noting and i should have done this earlier but like YOLO, um freedom of association is a thing right um at the point where you know you don't have to associate with a trans person if you don't want to or vice versa then like your freedom of speech is not going to be impinged upon in the same way because like if you don't associate with that person you can't have any legal percussions because you're not in an environment where that could potentially happen that is to say as a trans person if someone is going to continually misgender me or like i'm probably going to try and avoid them because i can unless it's in like a workplace or whatever in those workplaces there are mechanisms to actually avoid this from having to go through the legal avenues to start with that's fine if you don't like trans people, don't associate with trans people so that you don't put yourself in this situation. It's an easy law to follow, little consequence. I'm happy to support it as a precedent for all things that I see. So we have to reject this resolution overall. And my, my opponent brought up some good points. And I think we both agree that there needs to be a conversation about improving just overall saying hey it's respectful to call people of their gender i think we can both agree with that it's respectful it's something that should be encouraged right but the issue is an overall do you trust your government enough to give them the power to mandate speech not necessarily say you can't say certain things but to say that you have to say certain things and if you're not saying those certain things then the government will punish you i don't think that creates discourse i think that creates cultural marxism of step in line or be silent and you are you're talking about how censoring can encourage and blow up discourse. I just don't think that's true. If it, it 
sure, you're going to have underground discourse that will keep talking. But if they're suppressing the discourse where news outlets can't talk about it, where you, you can't have someone on the news that's going to offer a different point of view because that will be censored and oppressed, you have to look at those things. You have to see how this law will be practically implemented. And the precedents are in Canada. And in Canada, all we're seeing is restriction of speech. We haven't seen an improvement of trans suicide rates. We haven't seen improvements on trans mental health from this law. All we've seen is oppression of speech. And so unless I'm going to see a huge improvement, I can't accept it. Well, in the last 10 seconds, I'm just going to address those things. Happy to support this precedent. I gave you reasons as to why that's true, and it's likely to lead to good discourse. 